Um, tonight's speaker is going to open our um, free public lecture series that we have for throughout the exhibition. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Mary McCall, a woman from Kerry, as I've been told I have to mention. Um, she has numerous credentials, qualifications, and publications. So instead of going through all of them and having no time for a lecture at the end, I thought I'd just mention a few. Um, she's lecturer in women's history and gender history in the women's studies in UCD. She's also a member of numerous committees as well, uh, including the National Museum of Ireland's 1916 Exhibition Advisory Committee, Women's Historical Association of Ireland, and the National Archives of Ireland's uh, Advisory Committee. Now that's only a few of many that uh, Mary is on. Mary has also been instrumental in the 77 Women Project, which is in Richmond Barracks. That looks at the 77 women that were arrested and held in Richmond Barracks during 1916. And um, she's an expert on Come On the Lawn, and she was also a historical consultant on the exhibition here in the College Surgeons and Surgeons with myself and the 2016 Committee. <coughs> so I am delighted, and it is a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Mary McCall. Uh, thank you, Maeve, and, and may I say it was a pleasure to work with Maeve and all the uh, people here at the Royal College of Surgeons to bring this exhibition together, uh, and to the designers, Vermilion Design. I think all of you who've seen it will say uh, it is a, a very special exhibition uh, that has come out of oh, a year and a half of fretting and work and research. But we're delighted it has all come together. And tonight what I want to talk about is what we discovered during that year, year and a half of work. Um, starting with Maeve and myself and then expanding out into the, the team that brought it all together. And really, um, when you think about it, the Royal College of Surgeons wouldn't be a place associated with the Easter Rising 1916. It was very much an establishment institution. Um, part of, uh, many of the surgeons and doctors trained here would have spent their careers within the British Arms Forces overseas or in, um, in the British Isles. So uh, in lots of ways, um, there, isn't the, there aren't those obvious connections, but actually when we did the research, and those of you, um, you can pick up a copy of the, the book that goes along with it, you can see that there are connections um, between surgeons uh, and the Irish volunteers and those who actually spent Easter week here in 1916. Hence the title of the booklet, Surgeons and Insurgents. Um, now, one of the questions people all, uh, often ask is why on earth did the rebels choose Stevens Green? Uh, when you look at the green today, uh, and it is much more wooded than it was in 1916, if you look at the model out there, you can see that it was, it was quite a bare landscape because it was a garden um, green in, in the Victorian sense. Um, and so you could see from all the high buildings around. So the uh, Irish Citizen Army, Michael Mallon and Countess Markovich and the rest of them came up and started digging drink, uh, trenches in the green. Of course they were overlooked by the buildings. But there is m method in their madness, actually, when you, when you look into it. Stevens Green was chosen as an outpost because of the four major routes into the city which converged here and still do to this day. Uh, those being Bagot Street and Marion Row, Lower Leeson Street, Harcourt Street and Cuff, Cuff Street, which made its capture a priority. What they wanted to do was stop any uh, traffic of British Army soldiers coming in uh, from the south side uh, by Bagot Street, by Harcourt Street and Leeson Street, um, in through the green and of course then going down to City Hall or Jacob's Factory or the other outposts. Um, and that's why it isn't just the green that's taken, you also have Davies Pub um, to control Portobello Harbour, etc., etc. So when Michael Mallon and the Irish Citizen Army come here, uh, they're coming here with a depleted force because of the confusion of the countermanding order. Um, they're coming here with a depleted force and they had the intention of taking more of the buildings. Um, and people were used to seeing the volunteers and coming them on and the Citizen Army on route marches, so nobody took any notice of the fact that there was a, a, a route march coming up Grafton Street, and that's how they approach um, uh, Stevens Green in 1916. Uh, Mrs. Margaret Joyce, who's a member of the Irish Citizen Army, talks about 
the journey from Liberty Hall to um, through Grafton Street up Stevens Green, and they arrive here just around 10 past 12 on Easter Monday morning. The Irish Citizen Army, of course, were a very distinct group to the Irish Volunteers. We're most, more used to talking about the Irish Volunteers. Um, and they had been founded in 1913 uh, as a response to the violence visited on the striking workers in the 1913 lockout. Um, they were a workers' militia, but once the 1913 lockout was over, they uh, continued in existence. And one really interesting fact about the Irish Citizen Army, among many others, is they allowed men and women to join on a relatively equal basis. And, and the Irish Citizen Army, indeed, is the only uh, organisation that has two female officers serving in 1916, uh, Dr Kathleen Lynn, the Chief Medical Officer who was in the City, City Hall garrison, and of course Countess Markovich here uh, in the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, however, by 1916, under the leadership of James Connolly, the Citizen Army was constituting an armed militia who were in favour of breaking the link with Britain. Connolly had become convinced, especially since the outbreak of war in 1914 and the slaughter of young uh, working class men in the trenches throughout Europe, that now was the time to strike, to break the link. He was fighting both a national, uh, in the cause of national freedom, but also in the cause of class freedom. And indeed the Irish Citizen Army was very much part of that. And they were gathered and prepared to go out to fight. In the week before, uh, 1916, most of the army uh, actually remained in Liberty Hall where they were making the bombs, uh, as you see up on the table upstairs, a replica of those bombs. And those bombs that they were making are probably as um, useful as the ones that are in the table um, up <laughs> there right now. In fact, I think the National Museum has an unexploded one, still hasn't exploded uh, 100 years later. <laughs> So on, uh, when Easter Monday morning dawned, about 210 Irish Citizen Army members, about 182 men and 28 women, gathered in Liberty Hall. And they were given their orders and they marched to their various outposts. As Helena Maloney, who went to the City Hall garrison, said, they felt like they were marching into the sun for Ireland. They were committed to Irish freedom. Uh, about 150 of them come here with Michael Mallon. James Connolly takes about 38 of them and one woman, his secretary, Winnie, Winnie Carney, uh, to the GPO, and then the rest of the ICA garrison goes to City Hall, where they only last about 24 hours. But actually, there is an intersection there with the College of Surgeons as well. Uh, when uh, they attack City Hall, one of the first people shot is uh, Constable O'Brien, who's on, in charge of the gate. And he happened to be passing with Sir Thomas Miles. Uh, and he attended the wounded constable but was unable to uh, save his life. He had been fatally wounded at that stage. Meanwhile, Michael Mallon was taking heavy fire here in Stevens, in Stevens Green. They had dug trenches. They had set up a first aid station in the greenhouse. They were getting ready uh, to dig in for the week or for however long it was going to start. And he was overseeing the erecting of barricades uh, created under his command uh, by taking um, uh, wagons and cars off passing people. Uh, one of the things I want to address before we address their retreat to uh, the Royal College of Surgeons is the controversy around Contus Markovic, which has come up quite a lot in the last week or two, and I thought I'd take the opportunity uh, to talk about it, because in doing this research and in doing the other research that Maeve mentioned, uh, the 77 women of the Easter Rising, uh, I've had to do a forensic examination of um, the timeline uh, of leaving Liberty Hall and arriving at the various outposts. Uh, and according to that timeline, uh, taken from various so sources, um, Constable Lahif was shot here around uh, just after midday as the Irish Citizen Army arrived here. At that time, Markovich was in City Hall delivering Kathleen Lynn, who was the Chief Medical Officer there, uh, and by the time she arrived in the green, in Dr. Lynn's car, driven by uh, Mark Cummins, the rebels were already established here, uh, and Constable Lahif had already been shot. Um, however, the old canard that Con uh, Countess Markovic shot Constable Lahif and ran away screaming that I got him, I got him, has taken hold of popular imagination. Um, it is based on one unsubstantiated typed transcript of an original source that has not been seen. Uh, interestingly, there were several uh, armed uh, and uniformed Irish Citizen Army women 
in the Stevens Green uh, garrison. So in recognizing Countess Markovic, perhaps it is the fact that Markovic even then dominated the narrative. Uh, all other women were hidden behind the persona of Countess Markovic, and any woman in any sort of a uniform with a gun was Countess Markovic. So in lots of ways, I think we can see from this research, which is bringing up original um, uh, evidence, uh, that we can uh, make a new uh, impact, I think, in the whole Countess Markovic story. However, in moving on to what was happening in Stevens Green, once Countess Markovic arrived here, she was uh, made second in command by Michael Mallon. Um, and they continued digging in in the Green throughout Monday. Uh, at that time, a number of common Amman women and Irish volunteers joined the garrison in Stevens Green, including this woman here, Nora O'Daly, who took one look at the Green and said, uh, even to a mind untrained in military matters, it looked like a death trap. Um, and indeed, she was right. Uh, however, she decided she was going to join. She had left two small children at home. She was married and had two children. Uh, she left them at home uh, and decided to join the fight for Irish freedom. And this just shows, O'Daly's uh, activities shows how committed so many of these young men and women were to fighting for Irish freedom. And they were young. Even the leaders were in their 30s and 40s. Most of the participants in this image here is of, the, of 66 women who were imprisoned. Uh, and this was taken in May 1916, about two weeks after they were released from Kilmainham Jail. And you can see the youth of most of those uh, participate, participants in 1916. The same with the men. One of the youngest killed here, uh, one of the youngest of the garrison killed here in 1916 was 17-year-old Fred Ryan. Many of the participants are what uh, Roy Foster refer re refers to as vivid faces. This new generation that had rejected the moderate constitutional politics of their parents and now were using militancy to break the link with, with uh, England or with Britain. However, uh, the, as they dug in in Stevens Green, they were being strafed from all the high buildings around them, particularly the Shelburne Hotel. And many people say, why didn't they take the Shelburne and not the College of Surgeons? Well, if you look at the Shelburne, it's all glass. Uh, the College of Surgeons is a much more secure building. In a military sense, it made more sense to take the buildings that had a, a more stone-based front aspect. And indeed, they take the College of Surgeons before uh, they have to retreat from the green. It's actually taken on Monday when John Freeman Knott, a, a fellow of the College of Surgeons, known as an elderly, erudite, and eccentric scholar, who didn't notice there was a rebellion going on around him. Uh, he was walking, and he was in his daily habit of attending to his research at the college, and oblivious to everything that was going around him, he walked down the street. Uh, the porter saw him coming, the porter who had been given instruction earlier to secure the college, saw him coming and cracked open the door to tell him to go home. Uh, and in that moment, uh, Markovic, Frank Robbins, uh, Noro Daly, and a few others who had been given instruction to take the college, forced them their way in the door, uh, uh, held the porter under um, a revolver, and told him they would shoot him if, they, if he didn't uh, hand over the college to them, basically, which he did, uh, a very sensible man. Um, as this was a bank holiday, there was nobody else in the college apart from Duncan and his family. He lived in a, um, uh, an apartment here. He, had, uh, he was locked in that apartment where he would spend the next three or four days, and he said he did, they didn't feed him at all, so uh, the poor man had a lot of, uh, of troubles. As the Irish Citizen Army then were bedding down in the green, um, they uh, felt they had done as much as they could do at that time. However, um, as I mentioned before, we now see the first connections with Sir Thomas Miles. And this is Sir Thomas, who will go on to play a, a very interesting role in the College of Surge, or in the week of 1916. Tho Sir Thomas, of course, had been already involved in the Irish Volunteers. He had been par a participant in the gun running in 1914 to bring in guns. He, not at Hoth, but at the a lesser known gun running in Kilcool, his yacht was used to bring in guns for the Irish volunteers. Uh, and indeed, he would have known lots of them. Later on in the week, he will meet Eamon Martin, who was one of the Nafinia boys who took the guns off the yacht in, Kilcool, uh, in Kilcool. So it's, it's very interesting, number one, how small a place Dublin was. 
and how everybody knew each other in lots of ways, but also the intersections that are happening here between the surgeons and the insurgents. And indeed, as I said, Thomas Miles was passing City Hall when Constable O'Brien was shot um, by Sean Connolly, who himself would be shot dead less than an hour later. Uh, Sir Thomas could not uh, save uh, O'Brien's life, but he went on then to Richmond Hospital where he gave his services for the rest of the week. Back in the College of Surgeons, this very interesting woman, a Glasgow-born member of Common and Mon, Margaret Skinneter, um, woke up in the middle of the night to find that gunfire was strafing the girls in the, in the summer house and they ran for safety behind one of the embankments. <coughs> Uh, Skinner was one of those women who were very committed to the fight for Irish freedom. She was also uh, an excellent shot, and she's known as the sniper of 1916, or the sniper woman of 1916. From, uh, in the months before the rising, she had been delivering ordnance and ammunition and bomb-making equipment from Glasgow to Dublin on several trips. And then she was told by Markovich, whom she was friendly with and whom she stayed with when she uh, visited Dublin, that the rising was about to happen. So she was a teacher. She, it was the Easter holidays. Time, time to you know, go on your holidays and have a rising. Um, so she comes to Dublin to participate in the rising. And she becomes the, uh, one of the dispatch carriers and couriers uh, between the College of Surgeons and various other places in that first day. And indeed, she is the woman who cycles over to the GPO after, in the first hour or so um, to tell them they've secured the Stevens Green, and she brings back the tricolour that will fly over the College of Surgeons for the rest of the week. Um, on Tuesday morning, because the British have brought in uh, machine guns into the uh, Shelburne Hotel, uh, the, fire, uh, the firing on the green is very intense. Uh, Michael Mallon decides they're going to have to retreat. They have already secured the college. Uh, so they decide they're going to run across the road uh, and behind the, the very sturdy walls. As Margaret Skinner said, uh, the bullets flying off the walls were like dried peas off the walls. They were making no impact whatsoever. Skinner is sent to bring the 16 men guarding Leeson Street Bridge into the college. And as she cycled through Leeson Street, she saw the soldiers at the top of the Shelburne aiming their machine gun at her. And she said, bullets struck the wooden ring of my bicycle wheels, puncturing it. Others rattled on the metal rim or among the spokes. I knew one might strike me at any moment, so I rode as fast as I could. My speed saved my life, and I was soon out of range uh, of the machine guns. She returned with the 16 men, and all but a few men then retreat to the College of Surgeons, and they remain there for the rest of the week. Once they get inside, uh, they go about securing the College of Surgeons, and Frank Robbins who gives a very interesting um, witness statement to the Bureau of Military History, gives us an idea of what happened once they got into the College of Surgeons. As you can see from the recreation, they board up the windows of the ground floor um, and all the doors, so now there's only one entranceway, and that's the York Street entrance. The best snipers were then stationed on the roof and at the windows of the boardroom, which faced onto the green. Um, the, uh, as, ma as the, the machine guns were on the Shelburne and the United Services Club, they came up with a plan to neutralize those. The plan was to bore through the houses towards Grafton Street, set the houses there on fire so that the smoke would create a, uh, a smoke screen and obscure the vision uh, of the British in the Shelburne. And as Robin said, our company was to get ready to break through and occupy the houses beginning from the Turkish Baths to, to, through to South King Street. We left the College of Surgeons by the back gate. A password was given. We were admitted into the Turkish baths uh, where the operation of breaking through from house to house began. And it was a very good plan. The only problem was they didn't have enough men. Because of the countermanding order, there were never enough men here at the garrison to carry through, uh, men and women obviously, to carry through the plans uh, to take any more of the houses. The immediate concern of the women of the garrison was to set up their, re-establish their first aid station, which they did in the college hall. And as you can see, this is a picture of the actual original first aid station, which was behind the, the big screen on which lantern slides were shown for the medical students of the college at that time. Uh, no one but the first aid assistants and casualties were allowed behind that screen. And it was run by Madeleine French Mullen, who of course, with her partner, Kathleen Lynn, would go on to found um, uh, St. Ulton's Hospital for Sick Infants in 1919. 
Um, and she was aided by Noro Daly, our, our very military-minded coming on woman, Bridget Murta of the Irish Citizen Army, and of course Rosie Hackett of uh, the Bridge fame uh, and of the Irish Citizen Army. It appears that Madeleine French Mullen was a calming influence throughout the week, uh, and which was most welcome because the number of casualties they had to deal with increased day on day, many with severe wounds. Uh, she was, O'Daly said, a woman to inspire confidence and trust, an honest, brave and quiet person. And they soon had their first casualty. Michael O'Doherty, who had been on the college roof, was raked by machine gun fire from the Shelburne and seriously wounded. He actually fell over the side of the roof and had to be dragged back on and dragged down by his colleagues. The women managed to stop the flow of blood and get him bandaged up. He was subsequently taken by the Dublin Fire Brigade to Mercer's Hospital and from there to Dublin Castle's um, first aid station there where he recovered from his wounds. So once they were established in the College of Surgeons, they settled in um, and uh, began to uh, figure out what they were going to do about their situation on the green. At this time, however, as well, uh, the surgeons who were associated with the College of Surgeons began to gather in the different hospitals around uh, uh, the city. <coughs> The casualties in uh, many of the hospitals around Dublin were dealt with by the men and women associated with the RCSI. In Mercer's Hospital, cases were attended by surgeons Monsell and Wheeler. During the war, William Ireland, de Coursey, William Ireland de Coursey Wheeler served in the RAMC. In 1915, he converted his private hospital, 35, 33 Upper Fitzwilliam Street, into the Dublin Hospital for Wounded Officers and made it available to the St. John's Ambulance. Later in 1916, he would visit the Western Front and be attached to a casualty clearing station near Yip. However, he was in Dublin during the Easter Rising, uh, and on Easter Monday, he made his way to Mercer's Hospital to deal with an officer, Captain McCullough, who had been, uh, who'd received a chest injury on the green, and on Tuesday, he went to the Shelburne to treat, treat casualties there. It's reported during the Rising, he dealt with about 200 casualties at Mercer's, and at, he, uh, at number 29 Lower Fitzwilliam Street, where a, temp a temporary hospital was set up. As I mentioned, Sir Thomas Miles went to Richmond Hospital, where he was dealing with the wounded insurgents, and the first one of the first brought in was Eamon Martin, the Fianna boy, uh, who'd been in charge uh, of the Fianna Cycle Corps at the Hoth uh, Kilku gun running, uh, who had helped offload and disperse the guns that Miles had brought in. Martin had been shot in the chest as he advanced up North King Street towards Borodstone with a company of volunteers uh, under the, common, uh, the command of uh, Commandant Ned Daly at the Four Courts. In other hospitals, like Sir Patrick Dunn's, uh, Sir Robert Henry Woods and RCSI graduates, Sir Arthur Ball and Dr Charles Munlo Benson were working, where uh, a nearby medical staff came forward uh, to treat the wounded. It's reported that the medical start, uh, staff carried over 79 wounded men, including soldiers and rebels, into the hospital. And that's the really interesting thing about the RCSI staff and many of the medical staff in the hospitals throughout Dublin. They treated civilians, rebels, and British soldiers alike, and indeed gave them all the same amount of treatment, um, irregardless of how they got wounded or what their political background was. Um, one young RCSI um, a graduate, uh, Charles Hatchett Highland, uh, who had graduated from the dental school in 1907, had offered his services down near uh, Northumberland Road. Uh, and unfortunately, he was killed in his garden by a stray bullet. So he's one of the civilian casualties of 1916. In Adelaide Road at the Ioneer Hospital, uh, Euphrin Montgomery Maxwell, sister of uh, the uh, famous uh, Trinity historian, uh, Constantina Maxwell, who wrote about Georgian Dublin, uh, also treated the wounded. She was a graduate of the college. And there they took 42 soldiers, th 13 of them convalescents, and the remainder Sherwood Foresters who had come in the night before. The Sherwood Foresters, of course, who had come in from Dunleary, these were all very young men. Uh, and one woman, uh, Sheila Humphreys, the uh, niece of the O'Rahilly, who's family lived on Northumberland Road, saw the Sherwood Hoff Foresters being killed uh, at the Battle of Mount Street Bridge. Uh, and she talked about the fact that these young men were no older than her brother, Dick, who was in uh, the GPO fighting on the other side. Uh, and indeed, many of the Sherwood Foresters had about two weeks training before they came to Dublin. 
They didn't know one end of the rifle from the other, their officers said, uh, and many of them were, were killed. In fact, that was the bloodiest battle of 1916. Uh, and so these young Sherwood Foresters were being treated uh, by the medical staff in the hospitals as well. Um, in Father Matthew Hall on Church Street, um, the Cumanamon women were running a uh, first aid station, having been sent there by Sir Thomas Miles. Um, and that towards the end of the week, uh, they write that the doctors at Richmond Hospital, where Miles was in charge, were very sympathetic. When the women delivered the last stretcher there, he, Sir Thomas Miles, put his hand uh, on my shoulder, on you, Banny Kunnell said, and I thought he was going to have me arrested, but he just asked whether we got any sleep. I said no, and he patted my shoulder, and he said, we girls had done Trojan work with the wounded. And indeed, Sir Thomas Miles helped Eamon Martin escape from Richmond Hospital. He got him to put on a military, he put on his own military uniform um, and had uh, them both driven out of the hospital in his own sh uh, chauffeur-driven car. No one stopped them and Martin escaped to Belfast and later America. This seems to be, have happened a few times. Wounded volunteers and ICA men who went into the hospitals who were known to the RCSI uh, surgeons uh, managed to escape. Uh, with nobody saying anything uh, very much about it. Uh, and indeed, one of the resident medical students in Sir Patrick's Duns went missing on Monday evening. Uh, he was later to have discovered to have joined the insurgents in the GPO. And this, of course, was James Ryan, who's seen here in this image with his sisters, Kit, Min, uh, and Nell Ryan, all three of whom sisters took part in 1916 as well. So these are the famous Ryans of Tom Cool, and James Ryan goes on to join Fianna Fáil and become Minister for Health in various Fianna Fáil governments in the Irish Free State and Irish Republic later on. Back in the college, as the surgeons were working busily in the uh, hospitals, the insurgents were making themselves comfortable and secure as possible. They did find the building a bit cold and drafty and uh, didn't really like the smell of formaldehyde, could complain about that a bit, uh, and the large drafty rooms, and they, they were a bit... Um, they found the specimens um, rather strange, uh, including the jars with human body parts preserved in liquid. Not many of them would have been used to dealing with that sort of thing. Um, on Tuesday night, Citizen Army member Limo Brown was assigned to guard a large room on the York Street uh, corner overlooking the green, uh, and that would have been the boardroom upstairs. This room had several large portraits, including a life-size one of Queen Victoria, as you can see here. Um, which he witnessed a young boy, one of a number of youngsters who should not have been there at all, one of the Fianna members probably, rip it to shreds with a bayonet, as you can see the evidence of his work afterwards. Michael Mallon, who was a very strict, very much loved, but very strict um, commandant, was furious at this. He had given strict instructions that the fabric of the building was not to be touched or not to be uh, destroyed in any way, and he had a very strict code of discipline and indeed, he threatened to shoot anybody who would do anything like that again. He also uh, forbade any drinking uh, of alcohol, except in the case if you were in the first aid station, because they didn't have anything else, any medicine, they did use uh, brandy and whiskey to help dull the pain uh, of any of the wounded. Um, but he, he had the garrison saying the rosary, he had them uh, get up at, at morning, he had them make their beds, of course, Mallon was an ex-soldier. He had joined the British Army as a drummer boy uh, when he himself was 14, 15 years old. He'd served in India. He'd spent almost 20 years in the British Army, so he knew what it was like to keep a garrison in order, uh, rules and regulations, strict timekeeping, um, trying to make them feel like a united garrison. Uh, he made his headquarters in the central room on the first floor and sta stationed snipers in windows and up on the roof. roof. He had to deal with what the, he was going to do with the British who had taken um, the buildings all around and were now encroaching on the College of Surgeons. As the week went on, the sort of noose of British military around the green and then around the college began to tighten. And particularly up on Harcourt Street, um, some snipers had taken over the buildings and were peppering the building. So it meant that no communications could go in and out of the college and they were being pinned down. Certainly by Wednesday, it was harder and harder to get communications from the GPO or the forecourts. Um, and they decided they needed to take out 
uh, the British soldiers that were stationed on Harcourt Street, um, and particularly the ones who were on the roof of the university church. Um, Margaret Skinner came up with the plan um, of a frontal assault on university church. Michael Mallon was not very uh, anxious that a woman would lead it, but she quoted the proclamation at him, having heard it on Monday, that uh, women were Irish men and Irish women, uh, the, full, the guarantee of full and equal citizenship, uh, equal rights and equal opportunity, um, and he had no argument against that, really. Uh, so led by Margaret Skinner um, and William Partridge, a trade union organiser and Irish Citizen Army member, a small group of insurgents, including Fred Ryan, moved towards the Russell Hotel at the intersection of the Green and Harcourt Street, and they hoped to gain access to the roof of a shop adjacent to the hotel and launched a counter-attack counter -attack on the snipers of the roof of University Church. However, as they tried to sneak along by the walls, uh, obviously they were seen or heard by the snipers who fired on the party, and poor Fred Ryan, at 17, caught a full blast from the first volley and was killed instantly. The second volley hit Skinner, who fell badly wounded with three or four wounds uh, to the ground. The others dived for cover and Partridge decided their plan was in vain. Hoisting the wounded Skinner up, they ran back to the college and safety. And when they arrived back in the college, this was the most serious wound um, injury that the women of the first aid uh, station had to deal with. Um, French Mullen did her best to stem the flow of blood and they had to probe the wounds without anaesthetic, I'm sure they gave her a drink of brandy, uh, to remove the wounds, but all the while Madame, she said, Markovic that is, held her hand. Later that day, Skinner recalled Markovic and Partridge left the college to retrieve the body of Ryan. They were fired on and returned fire and Markovic repeatedly said, I, uh, you were avenged, my dear, because she killed two of the soldiers. Uh, soldiers. And this could be when the idea that Markovic killed uh, during 1916 comes from, because she does say she killed two soldiers at that time. One of the other issues that they had in the College of Surgeons, besides the smell of formaldehyde and the uh, scary looking specimens in jars all around them, and I'm sure skeletons or two, um, was the lack of food. They had Come because they had come to the college and the Greens singularly unprepared for a week-long uh, siege, basically, is what they got involved in. They had no food. Uh, as early as Monday, Frank Robbins noted that there was no food on the premises to be eaten beyond two eggs and tea, and most had eaten little more than a few dried crackers from Jacob's factory um, from Monday. On Tuesday, Citizen Army woman Nellie Gifford, in charge of the kitchen, and Chris Caffrey, um, another woman uh, from the Citizen Army were sent to Jacob's factory and came back with a lot of biscuits and crackers, uh, but you really can't live in that. <laughs> Nellie Gifford had uh, trained in domestic economy, however, um, came from a very large family. Of course, her sister is Grace Gifford, much more famously known for having married uh, Joseph Plunkett uh, in the hours before he was executed in Kilmainham Jail. And indeed, all the Gifford sisters were very much involved in feminism and nationalism in the lead up to 1916. Um, and Markovic uh, mentioned that in the College of Surgeons uh, that Nellie produced the most delicious uh, oatmeal porridge uh, from where she did not know. But she did food runs. And again, to emphasize the danger of what the men and women were undergoing, many of them were going to and from the College of Surgeons going out to commandeer food from shops in the vicinity, and apparently they left IOU notices. Uh, I don't know how the shopkeepers were ever going to claim that. Uh, and they cooked whatever they could find in the, uh, in the shops. Uh, Markovic describes the quality of oatmeal from somewhere, uh, and she made pot after pot of the most delicious por porridge, which kept us going. But food and rations were going to be scarce throughout the week and could only be obtained by tunnelling from house to house. Uh, where they foraged for food. Indeed, Hannah Shee Skeffington, who on Wednesday was searching for her husband Francis, whom she hadn't heard from, and whom she didn't know at this stage had been shot in Portobello Barracks um, illegally um, uh, by a British officer, uh, arrived from the GPO with a big sack of food for the garrison in the College of Surgeons. However, they managed to stay here for the week and by the, towards the end of the week, they began to notice all the fires burning, the fact that they could no longer get towards the GPO. Um, 
There was constant sniping and the depleted food, food supplies wore on their nerves and their energy. Because they were cut off, they didn't know that the surrender had happened on Moore Street and that the GPO had basically burned down. On Friday, they were expecting um, an attack which never came. On Sunday morning uh, and into Saturday, they were uh, expecting that attack. On Sunday morning, however, word was received of the surrender from Cumannamon woman Elizabeth O'Farrell, who arrived at the college with Major Henry de Courcy Wheeler, brother, of course, uh, of the surgeon de Courcy Wheeler. Uh, Rosie Hackett of the Citizen Army described the atmosphere as the news were deliver was delivered. She found Madame Markovitch sitting on the stairs with her head in her hands. She was very worried, but did not say anything. I just passed on as usual, and she only looked at me, but I knew there was something wrong. Mr. Mallon went round, shaking hands with all of us. Not everybody was happy with the surrender, and O'Daly wrote that there were many who would have preferred the alternative to fight unto the death and die at the hands of an enemy's bullet. But obedience is one of the first essentials of a good soldier, and they obeyed, bitter and hard though it was. Skinner did hear Markovitch urging Mallon to fight on, but he had received orders from his supreme commander, James Connolly, and therefore would surrender. The tricolour which Ma uh, Skinner had brought from the GPO and which flew over the college for a week was taken down and a white flag hoisted in its place. Skinner was now taken to St. Vincent's Hospital and indeed before she left, uh, she was given Markovitch's last will because Markovitch expected as many of the signatories and leaders of 1916 did to be executed. Um, she also probably was given the tricolour, which is now in the exhibition uh, hall upstairs. Um, at the moment of surrender, M Malin and Markovic called all the officers and men and women of the garrison into the large uh, lecture theatre. Malin explained to them the position and informed them as a soldier he intended to obey the order of his commanding officer. He ordered them to discard all equipment and guns, etc for until further notice. They gathered at the York Street entrance, uh, where apparently and famously Markovitch kissed her revolver before handing it over to Wheeler. Later newspaper reports of the surrender sensationalized this moment uh, of a militant, unrepentant countess fantastically dressed in male attire surrendering. And indeed, if you look at the newspapers in the days after the surrender, when they talk about women, they talk about women running around the place with guns in male attire as if every single woman in Cumannamon and the Irish Citizen Army was Countess Markovitch and looked and behaved exactly as she did. Um, the, the prisoners were then lined up and marched off towards Ship Street and then on to Richmond Street. Uh, Irish Citizen Army woman May Gahan remembers that the prisoners were pelted with bottles and horse dung as they watched, walked towards Richmond Barracks. And James O'Shea remembered how the soldiers were made a jeer and a joke of Madame Markovitch um, and how many of the... What